All right, everybody, welcome back to the Orchestra Podcast. We have an extra special guest today. I think I say that every time we have an episode, but this is indeed a very special guest. Uh, today we are uh, talking with Glenn Gabriel, who is a phenomenal musician and orchestrator who, who I know through uh, work with uh, an artist uh, known as Jennifer Thomas. She is mainly a pianist, and she writes a lot of really cool music that is uh, best accompanied by orchestras. And when you've just got music for two pianos, you need somebody like Glenn to come in and orchestrate that music for that accompaniment. So welcome to the pod podcast, Glenn. Thanks so much. Hello from Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could just start off telling us, how did you start down this uh, path of maybe n not just orchestrating music, but maybe making music? Because it, it sounds like maybe you took a non-traditional pathway. Yes, that's correct. I mean, uh, I started when I was probably six years old, and um, that's when I started listening to a lot of film scores, or, or mainly orchestral music, instrumental. And it really caught my attention for some reason, because, you know, you hear, you hear on the radios all these lyrics and the standard music that was playing. Well, back mm -hmm. in the time, it was mainly 80s music. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, and it didn't, uh, you know, talk to me as, as much as the traditional orchestral, classical, and film scores did. Yeah. So, uh, it, you know, it caught my interest. So I, I had a little keyboard about this big, and uh, <laughs> I started playing what I was hearing. Uh, I didn't know any, you know. Uh, well, and that's music. so important. That's one of the first steps to composing is, or like a, a student in a jazz program, their yeah. teacher will make them write down the solo that somebody else has played. Having oh, wow, that, okay. the, the audiation to write down something you've heard and, yeah. and, and notate it or at least reproduce it somehow is a really important first step in any kind of composition. So it's interesting to hear, hear you from your, the, the approach that you took to get where you are now that that was still a part of it. Yeah, it, it, well, it makes total sense. That's what started the whole thing. And, uh, you know, it gave me a good sense of tempo, you know, from, you know, the, the melody and how to shift. And then, you know, then I started writing with both hands. And, you know, I remember I wrote my first, first <laughs> composition when I was like seven. Mm -hmm. And it was so basic. It was because I could use both hands at the same time. Uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah that's where it started so i started listening to these you know scores uh, and um i didn't take any traditional learning because my first um encounter with a uh, a teacher was very bad actually <laughs> mm. yeah. and uh, unfortunately she scared me off because i came to this piano lesson i was all you know uh, excited mm. about it and then uh, she looked at my nails and said well you didn't you know, you didn't trim your nails. I was like, oh, okay. And uh, it was another student who, has been, who had been going there for a while. And uh, she, the teacher said, well, look at her nails. I'm like, okay, yeah, they're trimmed and nice. Good. Uh, you can sit here for the rest of the lesson and uh, watch her play. And that's all we're gonna do today. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I went home. I was very small at the time. So I, I was crying to my dad. I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely. So basically, my, my dad went to her and, you know, discussed the situation and maybe, you know, sheet music wasn't f for me. Uh, uh, so I actually start learning by ear. That's uh -huh. what we came up with, what, what I should do. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I started there. And uh, but then I, d I went away from t traditional schooling because I was scared of it personally. And uh -huh. uh, the whole thing I did when I was young was just play as much as I could. I, I can't say I was very good at it, yeah. but uh, I, that's what I started with. Well, and, and, and it's unfortunate that situations like that happen because what, what we want from the, the classical training side or just the, the free form welcome to music, have fun, is, is to get uh, students of any age to engage with music more, just to yes. spend time enjoying or making music. And there's so many things that we as professionals could let get in the way. Like, yeah. well, uh, you're making electronic music and you're using Ableton. Well, I don't work with people who use Ableton. I have to use, <laughs> right. you know, Logic Pro or why do, I don't know all the digital softwares. <laughs> right. uh, but we, we limit ourselves so much when we could just embrace that there's so many beautiful ways to make music. 
completely. And 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 uh, back then it was not the technology was nowhere. Oh yeah, it is I today. Can remember. <laughs> <laughs> So for me, I had the synthesizer with just like two tracks you could record on. So, you know, or, and I would record the piano as, as the main track and then maybe I could add some strings or some bass or whatever, but it was all, you know, live tempo and yeah. everything. Oh and, yeah. But, but um, the funny thing is, so when I was a teenager, I stopped uh -huh. and I went abroad. Uh, I live in Sweden and in, in, in uh, Scandinavia, Europe. And, uh, <clears throat> I stopped when I was about 15 and I went abroad. I lived uh, abroad for about 10 years. Really? And yeah, uh, I just wanted to know what life was about. Sweden is a very small, it's a very, you know, oblong country. <laughs> it's very it's, beautiful. <laughs> it, it is. I love, <laughs> Stockholm is one of my favorite cities. I, being Norwegian, uh, I, I dare say I prefer it to Oslo. Oslo can get a little, if there's a soccer match, I don't want to be anywhere near Oslo. Get me out of there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Norway is stunning. I mean, the scenery is there is amazing. But, uh, but uh, I, I've loved Sweden because of all the season, everything like Norway pretty much, but it was just too small for me. And um, uh -huh. I grew up watching movies and, you know, <laughs> You know, it's I was a big like, world. you wanted to get out and see more of it. Of course. So I lived, I lived uh, abroad, specifically in Hollywood for a few, a few years doing everything that you see in movies. People do when they get their dishes, uh, everything <laughs> you can to get by. Uh, but during this time, I, I listened to so much music. Um, uh -huh. I was buying all the albums I could get my hands on and uh, listen to everything. And when I got back, that was like 2005 not too uh -huh. long ago, I decided I would pick up this music again and uh, start doing this professionally. Uh, I didn't know where to start. So I just went to my best friend who knew his way around the computer. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, we, like I came with the melodies and everything and he programmed it and I learned by watching and, and doing. And then I went all out, you know, nerding on this for uh, years until I felt this was good enough to release mm -hmm. a bit well, and for any any teachers that uh, because this is for, yes for students but also for educators to watch this podcast, uh, don't ever belittle people who compose music using a, a like digital mediums like Ableton or the other ones because uh, if you've even tried just to put in one mel I mean it's a completely different language it uh, yes. it takes so many hours to master and not just to input the melodies and the instruments with the correct rhythms. But then all the other options and the effects that you can add in and third party softwares that you need to use and and calibrate and then trying to get it to pop out into one file that makes sense. I put that right up there with a, a master's degree in an instrument performance. It's, it's, I, it's really a, a challenge and a, a level of mastery that I don't have. I agree. Like, look, um, I think Hans Zimmer. Uh, put it very, very beautifully himself, where he said that the computer is an instrument in itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you master that, you can master an orchestra. Uh, this was not word by word quotation, obviously, but there are so many examples where, you know, back in the days, Mozart mm -hmm. and, and all the greats, uh, they used paper. Uh, and had to use their mind to come up with melodies and everything, write down in paper, and knowing how that would sound. Well, they, we, have a, we use what we have available. Exactly. And, and today we have means to, to have an orchestra right there in our mm -hmm. computer or, mm -hmm. or instruments right there to see how will it, you know, kind of sound like. So when you go to a recording session, you won't be disappointed. You won't waste people's time or money mm -hmm. uh, or efforts or, or, or make people bleed because they don't play the right thing because you've already thought those things out. So in many ways, I would say we're, we're more fortunate. And mm. if you know how to handle the computer, the better in today's media is specifically for what I'm doing in the now, film square. Now, in just a minute, I would love to see what uh, your digital workspace looks like. But first, how do you get from uh, a person who loves music and you're getting into all sort of making music digitally and now you're winning all kinds of awards and doing great things. So how, how does that transition happen? Wow. You know, I would have loved to tell you if I knew, 
uh, it, it really <laughs> happens. It really happens to be that I love doing what I'm doing and people seem to love it too. And that's where I'm fortunate enough to do what I want to do uh, and getting paid to do it. Um, mm. It really goes where it started off on back in the days before Facebook, there was MySpace. You remember that? Yes. And that eventually it kind of became a music platform instead of a social media platform. Yes. That's where I had my big break. You could say where directors could find my music and me and contacted me. And that's where I got my first big commercial gigs. Uh, and uh, from there, you just, you know, grew. Now, uh, what's just like a, a quick laundry list of uh, work that you've done that the kids might know about? Well, uh, I guess the most recent thing that that uh, they will know about it is the documentary uh, by James Cameron, Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Jackie Chan uh, was the Game Changers that came mm -hmm. out last year. Uh, was uh, I watched that? I had no oh, idea. Okay, great. The music for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I did great. write some of the music for that. I was part of the music team on, on it. So I, I would say we'll keep it right there. And then there's a lot of commercials and TV shows that you're watching every day that. Uh -huh. My music will pop into it. <laughs> well, and that's uh, the, we go throughout our days and we, uh, especially if you live in a metropolitan area, the, the sounds that you hear didn't just come out of nowhere. No. Like uh, no. one of my favorite subway systems is, is in Stockholm. And there's a, a myriad of different uh, sound cues that tell you what's happening as, you know, train arriving, train departing a couple of seconds before door closing. And there's different cues depending on which station you're at. Somebody <laughs> had to sit down and write that music. And I would expect that they were paid fairly for their time. Uh, so it, it's not just that we all need to put on the powdered wig and be Mozart and write music for the symphony. Uh, yeah. There's a career to be made just for the love of, of music, just making sounds uh, to uh, it, it, in, increase the, how do I want to say this? to better the experience of everyday life. Of course, of course, because you can specifically see this now in these hard times that we live in with the, with the virus and everything. Uh -huh. where, do people, where, where do people turn to? Uh, it's the arts, mostly. You mm -hmm. know, Netflix, Spo uh, Spotify, or Pandora, whatever you're listening to music to soothe you in this, this horrible time just to get some sanity into your life. And, and it's like this every day. And, and I think people appreciate that now more than ever because they're forced to, in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think we're finding some really interesting things about ourselves during the, this, this quarantine, uh, especially here in America, of confronting what it means to be with ourselves. <laughs> of of how, how much do we use our distractions to prevent us from, you know, maybe something simple like you know cleaning our bedroom or right. finishing our homework or or maybe something deeper like dealing with the relationship exactly and you know it, it also goes into there's some funny memes going out there in, on the, <laughs> online today uh there's one that I, I i was laughing out loud literally uh it was the composer before the virus uh -huh. The composer after the virus. It's the same picture. Oh, yeah. I, have seen, I saw the same one, but it was a, a, a organist. Right, right. Obviously. <laughs> uh, but, but what you say there is also discipline because, uh, and that's why I think the composer, mm -hmm. uh, and I mean film or media composer here. I mean, obviously music composers in all, all walks of life, but I'm, I'm specifically talking about my profession, is that it requires a lot of discipline. You have a lot of mm. uh, time uh, in this little box or this big box uh, in your studio mm -hmm. where you're supposed to make music on demand. Like uh, the director wants you to write something specific or, or mm -hmm. this is requiring something specific and now you have to do this. And people usually uh, don't have those requirements when it comes to creativity. Mm -hmm. They have it to their jobs or whatever they need to do. So now when they're sitting in quarantine, a lot of them don't know, know what to do with their time mm -hmm. because maybe they haven't had that time for themselves to build mm -hmm. a discipline that, you know, a lot of people probably thought like, oh, this is the time where I'm going to learn, you know, what Japanese or take piano lessons. But, but they're so worried and stressed out about different things. They, they can't focus and have the discipline to do that. While as a composer, this is your day to day life because, um, you know, bills won't get paid by themselves. 
uh -huh. and you know you have to make music and and survive in your creative creativity uh, then you basically have to put in the work and you have to find ways to be creative even when you don't feel like it or you have no re all reasons not to and uh, the on the topic of, of discipline quite specifically and uh, our, our mental well-being what a great opportunity to to look inward and solve some of these problems oh yeah i was completely. uh really really lucky to take a class with uh, a well-known um researcher of eastern religions his name is dr uh, eric hammerstrom okay and uh, at pacific lutheran university where i went to school and uh i picked up just kind of you know the general flavor of mindfulness trainings there and you know some of the basic understandings of those philosophies and then i was listening to another podcast and heard about this guy wim hoff do you know about okay. wim hoff no so he's a a a, a, a dutch um I don't know what you would call his profession, uh, but he's put together this technique of uh, breathing and cold therapy. Oh, okay. And uh, being Scandinavian, maybe you know something about uh, the sauna and then, you know, ice bath. Back yeah, and definitely. Uh, definitely know. I have some, some very angry relatives that lived a very long time thanks to that cold therapy. <laughs> uh, but the, the most important thing about the practice is that it is a practice, that every day, you sit down and you do the his breathing method, and then you you take the cold shower every day. And so when we went to quarant quarantine and everybody was so worried about the routines, my routine like it increased and became more focused. Yes. And I used that as a way to produce more, and that gave me the 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 mental focus to start creating this podcast and invite right. on people like you that now I get to share with my students who would never have known about, you know, who is this awesome composer, Glenn Gabriel, that their <laughs> orchestra teacher had the amazing opportunity to work with. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, so a lot of thing, uh, good things can come out of this. And, uh, but yeah, so that's, um, you just do what you love to do and, mm -hmm. and you put it on. And, and that's the other thing. MySpace was social media back then before mm -hmm. Facebook and then Facebook took over and MySpace was just left with robots basically. <laughs> uh, and then today we also know we can find the value of internet and social media because we can be in touch like this and also for my work, line of work, it's very important that life continues as usual for me uh, even though everything is in quarantine. I mean, I'm working on this film now where the director's in LA and sending me the exactly. cuts and, and, uh, and I can do the score from here while, you know, the post sound and mixing is happening over in LA, you know, concurrently. So this is very important. And that's how I got my work recognized. So I guess today, a lot of people put things on YouTube and uh, TikTok mm -hmm. or Instagram or, or Facebook mm -hmm. and they get their stuff out, which would be my number one uh, suggestion if you want to make it uh, because uh -huh. that's how I made it uh, yeah. accidentally. But I guess if you really believe in what you're doing and love what you're doing, I think that's going to convey or, you know, get over to the other, uh -huh. other side, whoever is experiencing in your music that this is, you know, because if you don't like what you're doing, I think that's going to be heard in your music or, or, or in what you're doing. Well, uh, if, if, kids are interested in taking this seriously and they're willing to put that kind of master's degree level effort into making music i think maybe now is the time where we could show them your your digital workspace oh yeah sure <laughs> they can see uh, how tremendously complicated it really is okay well again disclaimer on everything this is how i work it doesn't mean it's fantastic and uh, this is an old project i'm pulling it up because it's not confidential anymore uh, uh let's see how do i do this you should, there we go, I'll do like that. So here you go, if you can see my screen. Yep, and, and now just very, very slowly walk me through what the heck am I looking at because I'm seeing a lot of colors. It looks <laughs> like a kaleidoscope that maybe was broken by a child. <laughs> yes, so all these things are bars and I do the coloring for my own sanity. Uh, so mm -hmm. I will visually be able to see the difference between um, music sections. Okay. So you can see on, on top here, 
there is violence, solo violence playing. Uh -huh. And these are, I marked just uh, blue. So for each of these ones, if I zoom in a little bit, uh -huh. I go up here and you see all these things, these dots and everything, you know, uh, coming up. And that's the actual, the pitches themselves. Th these are musical notes. Now I get a very detailed zoom in on this little track on this solo violin right here. Oh, okay. So, so this is just, I, I use Ableton from time to time and this is the view that I'm used to seeing right here. Yes. Well, this is the beauty with all these DAWs that we're talking uh -huh. about, I that they all pretty much work the same way. Mm -hmm. It's just people have preferences and ideas of what is better than the other. It's like mm -hmm. an iPhone or, uh, you know, Android or whatever you have. Uh, they, they achieve the same purpose, maybe in a slightly different way. And maybe you yes. prefer the, the interface, but they, they achieve the same task. Yes, I, I would say they do. And then I can always get into discussions why I think something is better with what I'm using, which is Logic Pro. Uh, uh -huh. But then again, you have Hans Zimmer that uses, per what I know, <clears throat> um, I don't remember the name now. It's a very standard one. I don't remember the name now, <laughs> but like <laughs> okay. you go from Hans Zimmer that uses this um, Pro Tools. There you go. Pro Tools. Yes, Pro Tools, uh, which is very oriented to recording sound. So mm -hmm. you deal a lot with audio. And then you mm -hmm. have people that you use Logic like, um, like, um, um, wow, me with names today. The one who did uh, How to Train Your Dragon, Born, Born Identity, and so forth. John Powell, sorry, John mm -hmm. Powell. So he uses Logic. But they both uh, work together on several things, John Powell and Hansen, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I would say this is great for what I do. And then mm -hmm. somebody will say this is great for what they do. So they all look very similar. So we're, what you see here is all my notes. And uh, I have to write these things, um, you know, by detail. And you see all these bars have different colors as well. And that's the velocity. Yes, I was about to say that's going to be uh, velocity, attack, decay. Yes. Um, and, and then there's some other stuff. If you want to go real, real um, advanced, you can go on, on, on the automation. And um, I don't think we were advanced enough yet. No, but this is <laughs> this little curve down here is basically telling you how this instrument will behave. Will they play stronger? Will the legato be more slurred? Ah. Uh, and so forth. So you have to input this data as well. And mm -hmm. basically, um, we were talking about Mozart, right? Yeah. So he would write everything that, like this by hand. And... I do as well, but using this language. Mm -hmm. The great thing is if I press a button here, you can get the notation. I was about to say, how do we yeah. get from that to the notation to have someone play it? You will get this roughly, and you can get it for the whole orchestra as well. But then you do still ha need somebody professionally to go knows... and sort of clean it up and make it look like the Western musicians expect it to look. Exactly. And mm -hmm. depending on what orchestra you're using, they use different terminology because not everybody uses the international version. There's the Italian, the Italian way, the German way, uh -huh. uh, the Russian way and everything. But yeah, the UK, the UK is even a bit different than the US in, in, in just terminology, mm -hmm. you know? Well, like quavers, so, yeah. semi-quavers. Yeah. Semi -semi yeah, you got it. Yeah. You got it. So all this. So that's when you hyper zoom into the all these things and then uh -huh. we go down so these are all solo violins it's for a track that i did it's called nightmares or mares of the night you can find it basically on my spotify it's it's a folk swedish folk lore music uh interweave with orc uh hollywood scoring epic scoring kind of now if the kids want to find you on spotify do they just need your name or is there uh more information than that no no glenn gabriel is fine great yeah, and you'll find me with a bit more beard back in, in the picture in there. <laughs> well, I, I hope you'll be flattered, but one of my, my favorite uh, musical artists is uh, Vesin, and I, I've seen many of their shows, and I was looking through their Spotify playlist, and, and you actually popped up right next to them. Wow, that's amazing. That, I didn't know that. That's yeah. very flattering. I mean, very different music. <laughs> 
<laughs> Vaisen is great. Is is that spelled V A E S E N? V A with umlaut S E N. Yeah. And yeah, they, they've right. got the the I forget what his first name is, Johansson with the Nukelharpa and the Right, right, the Nukelharpa. That's a Swedish traditional instrument as well. And uh and Vaisen means spirits in uh, Scandinavian. Yeah. So, it's basically supposed to be entities, but back to the project. Yeah, so, right. uh, ahead. and then you have, I have violins, the first violins here. And you can see here in my little things, there are internal words that I have used for presets. So don't, mm -hmm. don't worry about that. And then you have the second violins, the violas, the celli, uh, the basses, recorders. So this was basically for a recording session that I did in, in London with uh, at Abbey Road Studios um, uh -huh. with a with a 50 piece or was a bit more than 50 piece orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically this is how it looks. So you have to put all these dots and, and bars together and compose a, a, a grand picture. And, you know, f funnily enough, uh, usually if it looks right, it is right even mm -hmm. uh, optically as to sonically. So yeah. Um, but I would say this is kind of messy, this file in particular, uh -huh. um, because it's not really gone through. Before, um, before I go to a, an, an actual orchestra, I have to clean this up and send it to somebody who actually transcribes everything correctly. Because again, uh -huh. uh, that's not my specialty. My specialty is putting together everything and composing the music and then I let the pros do theirs, uh -huh. which is to transcribe, to mix and, and all that stuff. But, and I I don't know how much experience you've had with it, but uh, trying to get this kind of thing into notation, if you have any, what's called, what I call a hemiola or tr like triplets, tuplets, uh, they really have a hard time translating into standard notation. It wants right. to make it like a, a 15 tuplet instead of, you know, a group of three, a group of two, and then a group of four. It right. makes them really messy. Well, you, you can see here, here's the celli. You can see that this is kind of, you know, spiccato. It's kind of hard and everything. So there's also that aspect that you have to respect what, it, what the person actually can do and work with the orchestra uh -huh. you have in front of you. Because it's happened to me a lot of times where I thought the orchestra could deliver what I wrote, but they couldn't uh, mm -hmm. because either I wrote it uh, unrealistically, but, uh, uh, but it also has to do with you know, some people are better than others. Some are more advanced in their instrument than others, but you mm -hmm. just have to be mindful with who you're working with and who is going to record it. And that's also a process in itself, you know. Um, and that speaks a lot to the, the studio musicians. I, I've done a lot of studio work in, in uh, Nashville back in the day. And yeah. every now and again, we get something like this where there's, uh, you know, an arpeggio that is just impossible to play quickly enough on violin. And yes. we would we would just go through and do a track where we play the first three notes, and then on the second track rest for those first three, and then play the other ones, right. uh, and then sort of reverse engineer to make it sound the way that the composer wants it to with the real instrument. Yeah, well, that's good. that 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 makes total sense to me. And there are several times where I've been in a recording session, and they go like, "Well, you know, we can't really play this. That, that's impossible. But can we do it this way instead?" And I'm like, "Okay, let's hear it." And then it's like, "Yeah, that's fine. That's even better. Thank you." You know. So the musicians uh, should mm -hmm. never be afraid to to you know uh, propose a way of doing it. But then there's also many times where uh, there's one orchestra that hasn't delivered really what what what's written but you go to another orchestra and they could because uh, yes because of the studio musicians like there's a whole difference of playing in a studio as a studio musician as opposed to a live uh, concert uh, mm. because uh, in live concerts uh, things can get by and uh, people will, will be okay yes, with that absolutely. in the studio it's recorded and you can't and people will listen to this on repeat and they'll go like why did this person play this wrong this sounds horrible <laughs> you know yeah well a live is, is a one thing, one time thing, usually, unless it's recorded that as well. But well, um, uh, as all, we all respect to the musicians. As we started this quarantine and people are asking me if I'm going to do some kind of digital orchestra, having done the studio work before, I know, you know, that's maybe not a good idea for the, yeah. the amount of time and precision that it takes. Because those studio musicians, uh, I'd, I'd bet any amount of money they could outplay any uh, you know, professional symphony or orchestra musician 
uh, hand over fist if they're not already in those orchestras to begin with. The, exactly. They usually are. And uh, they're usually teachers. They're usually multitasking uh, because, uh, you know, the live scene is not as big mm -hmm. um, as it's been before, although I feel it's growing a bit more now. Okay, not now, in this specific situation in life. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> Outside but, uh, of this particular situation. Yeah, exactly. And um, so, so um, no, I've, I've met some amazing musicians in my life, and I, I'm only happy when I get to work with them, because I learn more as a composer as well, because sometimes, I, as a composer, I, don't, I do not know, I cannot play every single instrument. I cannot. Mm -hmm. uh, it would take me a lifetime. Um, and I don't think I would be, my, my ability of composing would be only as good as I'm able to write for that instrument. Uh huh. Like if I, like the piano, uh, mm. I play the piano, not super good, but let's say I would be really good at it. I think mm. I would only write piano to the extent of my, my own ability. Mm -hmm. So if I don't know how they're played, maybe I'll push the limits a bit. Um, more than my own ability and i think that could be a good thing at the same time if you but the, but the most important thing i guess as a, a composer is to be able to understand how the orchestra works and what they can play and how they should sound and uh, go with there and, and then together with the musicians experiment and push some boundaries if your project calls for it well uh, i this has been just tremendous what you've walked us through here i'm so grateful uh, for you coming on the show. It's probably approaching nine in the evening for you, so we should maybe wrap this up. But I, <laughs> sure. I have one question that I ask of all of my guests, and if it's, if you could go back to when uh, you were a child and you were first discovering music and, and give yourself a bit of knowledge that you wish you had had, what might that be? Wow. Uh, I guess, stop worrying about things. Uh, it will turn out the way you do if you just believe in what you do and continue what you do. Uh, don't mm -hmm. worry too much. Um, that's the that's the biggest thing because when you deal with a creative line of work, I think a lot of people spend a lot of time worrying about things because we're mm -hmm. so sensitive. Yeah. You have to be in order to tap into emotions and convey Especially those. Especially if you've produced it, it's like they're criticizing your very essence. It is, exactly. And there you also put a very good thing is that distanti does it ha does it say do you say distantiate? No. What do you say? Differentiate? Differentiate yourself from your music is very important. That when people remark you your music, don't take it as personal because it's your music. It's not necessarily you. If you can do that, uh, and train to do that, uh, mm -hmm. you will you will be more able to take criticisms which could sometimes be lifting your spirit uh, then you would have emotionally attached to it as a, mm -hmm. a bad criticism because uh, at the end of the day i am me and my music is me if people listen to my music they would probably think i'm a melancholic um, depressed person <laughs> or, uh, uh, which is totally the, uh, the contrary to what i am i just tap into those emotions because i mm -hmm. find them very mm -hmm. interesting uh, when I'm a very happy person, generally. <laughs> All right. Well, th I think that wraps up our conversation. I've got a few more questions off camera for you, but thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.